So we finally arrived to the part where we're going to answer the question, what connects bats and dolphins? They hardly look similar. What's going to connect these two creatures? Right? Now, the question really is, sound can travel through a medium. Right? We want you to watch this right now and watch it as the compression goes. Right? And what happens as it hits the end on that slinky? It's going to come back. Right? So the compression goes, hits the end, the wall stops it and it begins to have a compression backwards. If I were to do this with a thread, the thread would go up, hit the wall and typically if it's a wall that's fixed, it'd come back in the opposite direction, downwards. In a longitudinal way, of course, it's not going to be that way. You take a spring, push it, it's going to go like as you can see, go hit the end and come back. What are you observing here? Right? In one sense, if sound is very similar to this, sound must also behave this way. The compressions are supposed to go. If they hit an obstacle, they're going to come back. Right? In other words, they're going to get reflected. Bouncing off is what we call reflected. And we know that light gets reflected. And in this chapter, we've already hinted to you that light is almost, in fact, light many times behaves like a wave. So when light gets reflected, right, and light in fact is a non-mechanical wave. So it doesn't need a medium to travel. Great. So if light is a wave, it gets reflected. Sound is a wave. And clearly a slinky is a wave. They all seem to get reflected. So sound must be no different. Right? If you want to visualize this in a more convincing manner, if you say, so slinky gets reflected, so why should sound get reflected? It's a very nice question. And the keen ones amongst you would have asked that, so I'm going to answer that. If you were to imagine it this way, right? I want you to take in your mind a picture of balls, little balls that com comprise air. And each ball starts hitting the balls next to it. They all compress, right? And when these balls go back, these balls that got hit by the previous balls go and hit the next balls. And so on and so on and so on and so forth, Right? So you can see these collisions happening in front of you. Now, of course, the last row of balls, where do they have to hit? They have nothing to hit. They go hit the wall, right? They hit the wall and what are they going to do? If they were balls of air are very similar to balls that we see, larger balls, but just that the ears of the balls of air are much smaller, right? So they're really, really small molecules as we can call them, right? Little molecules. They're going to go bounce off the air and come back. Great. So they're going to start bouncing back again. So it's almost like you're throwing a set of balls in the air. And they're all going to bounce back and come back to you, right? Each ball hits the other and it's going to come back to you. So it's, it makes logical sense for sound to get reflected. And it does get reflected. That's what we observe. Because if you go and stand on a cliff or on a really large mountain, it's, it's a mountain range where you have a huge number of mountains surrounding you. Now, why we need this, we'll ask you, right? Why don't we see reflections all the time? Why do we need a large area to see reflections or to feel reflections? Rather, to be really precise, to hear reflections of sound. Yeah, it's, it's fun to play with different modalities of senses, right? Yeah, where you take something that you see and act as if you feel it and take something that you hear and act as if you see it. It's called synesthesia, by the way, where you take one sense and feel it or represent it in some other sense. Because people who are incredibly good at math sometimes begin to feel numbers rather than see them. You listen to them speak, they'll be like, five is a very fat number or five feels very warm or something like that. Some, some musicians do that as well. When I ask my musician friends, how do you differentiate this sound from that? Because we told you timber is the frequency, the overtones and the undertones. That's how we define it. That's how I define it. The musician went, it's thicker, it's warmer and things like that, which didn't really make any sense to me. So in one sense, if you were to hear the echo, right, you, don't, you can't do it in a small room. You go stand on a large area and you shout, you seem to hear it back. The echo is nothing but a reflection, right? Sound reflecting off all those mounts. You go to a large auditorium where there's hardly any furniture around and shout, you're going to hear your voice again. So it seems like sound does reflect. And it does. So how can we use this? And what has this got to do with bats and dolphins? Let's begin to find out. The first question, if sound does reflect, does it also follow the rules that light does? I don't know. Let's find out. So let's imagine that somebody creates sound here. And they, the balls are getting pushed here and there, here and there, here and there. They go hit a wall. right? And let that be the angle with which they hit the wall. Now, I know that if I throw in one ball like that, it'll go hit and come down like this, right? So does it make any difference how much size it is? In this case, it doesn't seem to. So you go, go, go and hit those surfaces. All those balls are going to bounce off that way, just like light would. So in other words, just like a bounced ball or light, angle of incidence is going to be equal to angle of reflection, even for sound. Now, isn't that interesting, right? The fact that some two things we thought are very different following very similar properties, right? So I equals R even for sound. And... What you can do, what is the application you can think of immediately? Right? What can you think of? If I can throw a ball at a wall, it's going to bounce and come back to me. If I know how fast the ball goes, if I know how long the ball takes to come back to me, then I also know 
how far the obstacle must be, right? Isn't that a really good application? So we're going to see how we and animals use this in real life. So we know sound reflects, we know it follows some rules and we know the speed of sound. It's finite. So if you were a bat and if your life was confined to being in the dark most of the times and if you were a dolphin whose life was also con- you know, kind of confined to being in the dark most of the times because you go deep into the water, light doesn't reach much. It all gets you know, bent away. So that's what connects these two. Right? Bats and dolphins happen to have this one condition that goes together, which is they have to survive in situations where there's not much light. This is much light. So you can't rely too much on your vision. Great. So the, what we're discussing here is what's called convergent evolution. Two very, very different creatures put in the similar environment begin to develop characteristics that are similar. And what is a similar characteristic here? We're going to talk about it. So what a bat does, if you were a bat, what you would do is that you would send out a particular sound. Now, luckily, the sound that bats create are usually much larger than our frequencies. So what you can hear right now is a bat sound. You can hear like very small part of it. Yeah, because it's most of it is high frequency. A little bit that you hear is what the bat's going to make. It's going to create that sound. It's going to let it bounce off its prey or any obstacle or anything like that. And based on the time with which time at which this sound reflects back and reaches it, it's going to figure out how far away the object is. It's building a map of the world by figuring out how, fa- how long each of those sounds take. Incredible, right? Incredible evolution. It's called echolocation, right? So using an echo to locate. That's what it is. So that's what bats do. And dolphins do this as well. They do this underwater. They send out sounds that we usually don't hear. It goes up, reflects off a prey or an obstacle or a predator, somebody who's in danger, anything. Comes back to them and then they figure out, okay, it took two seconds. Therefore, it must be that distance away. In a couple of moments, we're also going to discuss how exactly they do that. Yeah? And the funny thing is, bats also figure out how fast their prey is going just with this mechanism. Right? It bounces off and comes back and the base, based on the way in which this happens, they even figure out how fast that prey is moving with respect to them. Incredible. Right? So more on this when you find out later on. But the first thing, of course, is how exactly do I find out how far away something is? So if you were a bat, so if you were a bat and you begin to send out a sound, right? the first thing you need to know is a sense for how fast sound is in air. Most of the times bats are moving in air. So if you were to know that, right? Sound takes about, sound travels at about 330 meters per second in air. So that's a number you can remember if you want to. Yeah. In air, of course, it's going to vary in solids and liquids and solids are going to be much faster. Yeah, and steel, for example, it's really, really fast. So if you were to take, because steel is highly elastic. So if you were to take the bat and imagine it's in air. So sound's going to take 330 meters per second. It's going to go at that speed and hit the prey and come back. Now, let us say for simplicity that the bat sent a sound and heard it back after two seconds. So it waited, heard the echo after two seconds. So now what does the bat know? The bat knows that the sound must have taken one second to go and one second to come back. Right? So the bat knows that the prey is one second away. In other words, one second for sound away. So if sound took one second, how far must the prey be? 330 meters. So the bat may not do all of this consciously. The bat has an inbuilt mechanism that does this for it. Of course, the dolphin is going to use a different numbers for it, but the different numbers to calculate the same thing. But the mechanism is pretty much the same. Echolocation. Great. So this is what can, kind of puts bats and dolphins together. They both use echolocation to move around in this world. Now, how else do we use this? So we always copy nature. So when a submarine wants to figure out where another submarine is, then what it does is that it sends out these kind of waves. Sound waves, which could be high frequency, usually high frequency. Goes and hits the submarine, comes back. And based on this data, we figure out where the submarines are. It's called radar. Yeah, that's what it does. And also what we have is sonar where you have depth of the seas is measured by taking a boat, you keep a boat and then or, or, a, or a ship that can produce sound. And it also has a receptor. So it has a sound source and a sound receptor, something like a ear, right? But an electric ear. So it sends out the sound, goes and hits the surface and comes back. So you know the time it took, you know the speed of sound in that medium, then you can figure out how far away the bottom of the surface is. So you can figure out the depth of the sea without even going inside. Right? It's a pretty good application. So let's do it with numbers here. So let's say that the speed of sound in that medium is V and it took a time T. Then what must the distance be? Yeah. Let's say the distance is D. Yeah. Now we're going to play with alphabets here. So if the distance is D and if the speed was V, 
and the time was t how do you relate these quantities right two times d is going to be equal to the overall distance travel and that must be equal to what distance equals speed into time right so two times d equals v into t therefore distance must be equal to vt by 2 you can rearrange this however you want and write it for your convenience but that's the crux of this now the overall thing we've seen is that light reflects and you can use this in very interesting manners for echolocation sonar and submarines use this now the last part of what we're going to talk about is can light reflect only once or can we have multiple reflections turns out that we can have if it can reflect once there is no reason why it can't reflect more than once so the question here is how do these loudspeakers work yeah what a loudspeaker really does is that it takes the sound that's going to go in all possible directions and confines it to a particular direction so if you want people in that direction to hear your sound a lot then what it does is that the sound that's trying to escape gets reflected off its boundaries and all of them get start getting you know reinforced and lots of sound goes in that direction that's what loudspeakers do so loudspeakers are in one sense using the reflection of sound to be able to amplify it and show it in a part and send it in a particular direction now the great thing about this is that when this happens right when you have multiple reflections in a room you go and stand because you have one reflection you hear what's called an echo but if you go to an auditorium it's reflecting off multiple places you hear what's called a reverberation because you say something and then what you're hearing right now right what you're hearing right now is the same sound that we make along with the reverberation so multiple reflections are superimposing themselves on the sound so this entire module has been about how sound reflects more than once creating echoes and reverberations so now we welcome you to probably one of the most interesting modules here which is uh, sound is created when a source produces an oscillation right now what would happen because you would surely have this question right what would happen if the source that's creating the sound itself begins to move because so many times you see that right now we want you to experience this first if you haven't so we want you to put on your earphones you may or may not close your close your eyes it's up to you but begin to listen to this now what did you observe one of the experience you had was the source of sound comes closer and closer towards you and leaves something changes right of course the volume is increasing and then decreasing but something else as well the frequency of the sound begins to increase as the source of sound reaches comes towards you and decrease as it goes away from you right it's called the doppler effect the doppler effect says that if a source of sound is moving closer towards you the frequency you perceive will be higher than the actual frequency it creates but didn't we say the frequency is a property of the source it never changes but it is in this case the source is moving right so in one sense the source is kind of creating this problem as well so source is moving with respect to the medium and the person inside who's sitting and trying to listen the nitty gritties of this we'll not go into right now but the idea is we want you to just imagine this if i were here and if we were to create a sound it's going to create a compression that's moving through air at a given speed but if now i begin to move right i begin to create the next compression closer than it would have actually been right if i had been here then it would have actually been so if i was here the next compression would have come somewhere here but now i've already moved a little bit so next one's here then i go even closer next one's closer so what am i doing as i move i'm kind of pushing these compressions to go closer and closer to each other and when two compressions are closer the frequency increases and that's what we perceive because when you hear the sound you don't know why it really was closer right all you will perceive is the frequency with which it reaches you and the exactly it's the exact same analogy is true for the opposite right if it goes going away and away and away what begins to happen one compression is created but before the next one's created the object is already moved a little farther away so the actual frequency would have been something but it's now decreased because the crests are moving or the compressions are moving further and further and further apart so when you hear it you hear them as farther apart or low frequency so what do you observe here something passes you it's going to increase in frequency and then decrease along with the volume of course the volume of course being the fact that the closer it is the less dissipation it has to undergo but then there's one question that remains right so if a source moves its frequency increases right when you perceive it what if the source goes so fast that you know the source is compressing 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 the source goes so fast that it goes faster than the speed of sound itself in other words it creates a compression and beats that compression something incredible happens when this begins to happen because we have already experimented with this we have aircrafts that go fast in the speed of sound they call supersonic aircrafts so what they do is that they create some sound but they go ahead of it 
And we don't have to go that far to find out supersonic sounds. What we can do is take a whip, the bull whip, and crack it, right? In other words, you whip it really hard. The tip creates a very cracking noise. It creates, it's called the crack of the whip. The crack of the whip is created because the tip actually begins to go faster than the speed of sound. So whenever objects go faster than the speed of sound and they create some sound, what we know is that we hear something all around a very, very harsh noise called a sonic boom. And we're not going to go more into this right now, but it's good for you to know that when objects go supersonic, something called sonic boom is created. And that's what when the, con- when the concord or concord or however it has to be pronounced was around, when it was moving, the entire area used to rumble with the sonic boom. It's a big pain, right? So what we've done here is understood that sources themselves can move. And this brings us to our last question, which is, how exactly do we hear? Right? Some compression in the air, some rarefaction in the air, whatever. Yeah. How does that translate into the sensation of hearing in my head? And that's going to be the last leg of this journey of us.